everybody and welcome to the ESCO series of the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. The ECCT is a nonprofit organization promoting fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, in cell therapy and genetic vaccines. And education is part of our mission. And we therefore launched the e-school seminars, as you may already know. Today, we welcome Professor Drew Weissmann from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's a professor of medicine, and his research is focused on RNA and innate the innate immune system. And he applies this knowledge to the area of vaccine development and gene therapy. And today he will speak on synthetic vectors to take the best from the virus and go beyond. Thank you very much, Drew, and we are looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you very much, Hildegard. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about, <coughs> excuse me, right, bad allergies, um, are synthetic vectors and their use in gene therapy and other genetic manipulations. So when you think about synthetic vectors, they, they, they're composed of a couple different components and there's a big selection process, and we'll go through much of this in the lecture today. Synthetic vectors can deliver any type of nucleic acid. What's most commonly delivered nowadays are mRNA, DNA, and siRNAs. The other component is the carrier of, of what wraps the nucleic acid and allows its delivery. And they can be based on lipids, on polymers, on sugars, on chitosan, on, on many different materials. So when you think about designing a synthetic vector, you first have to choose the gene that you want to target if you're doing a gene therapy application. Then you have to choose the coding sequence. You have to choose the type of delivery system, the type of vector, whether it's a lipid, a cationic polymer uh, or other material. You then have to figure out how you're gonna deliver it. And the two main delivery routes are in vivo and ex vivo. So you, 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 you'll often take bone marrow cells out of a patient, treat them with a synthetic vector in order to modify the genome and then deliver those back to the patient. That's great if you're treating a few hundred cancer patients or, uh, or, or serious genetic disease patients. But if your goal is to treat, say, sickle cell anemia in hundreds of millions of people, that's not an applicable procedure. So there you, we need to develop in vivo delivery methods, which are what synthetic vectors are very good at. And the final is how you deliver it, what method do you coax that particle to go into the cell? So getting into the cells, and th this is a, a very general description of ways that particles are taken up into cells. Phagocytosis, which is mainly an antigen presenting cell uh, function, is the act of cell eating, where a cell will bind and engulf a, a foreign uh, or other type of particle. Pinocytosis occurs in both small and large fashions, and that's where a, a cell essentially engulfs the exterior environment. And then finally, receptor mediated, where cells have specific receptors that can bind to ligands on particles and specifically take them up. It's a size dependent procedure and different size particles can be taken up by each of these methods. This can be overcome by using a receptor mediated endocytic mechanism. So the, the first question is, how do you get the nucleic acid across the plasma membrane in, in order for it to reach the cytosol of the nucleus in order to be translated? If you start with the lowest form of life, bacteria, bacteria have very specific mechanisms for taking up DNA. And bacteria want to take up DNA. That's how they expand their genome and expand their functionality. Bacteria have specific receptors that can take up single-stranded DNA and translocate it into the bacteria. 
that then can be taken up in a RECA dependent process and inserted into chromosomes or plasmids. Plants are ignored, and these are actually the most interesting, at least to us RNA folks. Plants use extracellular RNA as a method of communication. So a root will produce a specific RNA and release it in a, a, in a, uh, a, 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 a an exocytosis model that will then allow it to travel to other regions of the plant, the leaves, uh, the meristems, in order to direct those structures on functions that the roots thinks it's time to do. So this process uh, maintains homeostasis, it can silence genes, it can attack uh, pathogens and has many other physiologic processes. So the, the proposed problem when you now get to eukaryotes is that you need a carrier molecule, uh, whether it's lipid, cationic, polymers, chitosan, other materials that does multiple things. It has to bind and condense the nucleic acids into a particle. It has to protect the nucleic acids from enzymatic digestion. It has to promote the uh, uptake by the cell and it has to release the nucleic acids into the cytoplasm. So if you look at a plasma membrane, you can see the problem. Long, uh, very large, very long nucleic acids uh, that are negatively charged uh, with vast hydrophobic areas cannot cross an intact plasma membrane. There are many components of a plasma membrane though that can be used. So there are receptors that can be bound that promote endocytosis. There are natural and acidic processes that a cell can perform. Crossing over now into how we inject or deliver nucleic acids to a cell, one of the first methods that was developed and is highly efficient is a direct transfer of nucleic acids into the cell. This involves essentially sticking a needle into the cell and injecting your nucleic acid into the cell. It's, it's highly efficient, uh, approaching 100%. The survival rate is usually very good. The problem is, is that you can only do a few cells and it's a highly technical process. So this is good when you want to inject the nucleic acid into an ovum in order to make a, uh, a transgenic mouse or, uh, or other similar procedures, but it has really no usefulness for mass gene therapy to correct genetic disorders. The next are two methods that have been developed uh, uh, over the past 30 or so years. One is using protein molecules that condense and deliver nucleic acids across plasma membranes. I just uh, listed a couple of different types of proteins that are capable of doing this. The other and the most commonly used are liposome mediated transfers. So liposomes are lipids often containing a cationic lipid that will bind to nucleic acid and form a uh, essentially a lipid particle where the nucleic acid is either inside or outside of the lipid molecule. The next method that's commonly used and, and is, has had really had a rebirth for in vivo delivery is electroporation. And here an electric charge is placed over the cell. And what that does, and you can see in the pictures, the electric charge causes the production of small holes in the cell that allow exterior material to flow into the cell. What's interesting about electroporation is you would guess that the material would enter the cytoplasm if you're simply punching holes in the cell membrane, but in fact, they go into lysosomes. Here's a, a picture showing that just about every method of delivery of particles to cells results in lysosomal delivery. So the, in the top row, the plasmid is in green. 
lysosomes are in red, when the plasmids, in this case the plasmid, but it could be RNA, siRNA, other nucleic acid, are taken up by electroporation, by lipids, by proteins, they all enter the lysosomes first. So you have a merger of the lysosome and the plasmid in the same structures. That leaves you with the next problem, which is getting into the cell is one difficulty. Getting out of the lysosome, or the endosome, is then the next step because the nucleic acid has to make it into either the cytoplasm or the nucleus in order to be translated. So there are many hypotheses uh, for how nucleic acids can get out of an endosome. The first is what's called the proton sponge hypothesis. Now, usually when you make a liposome, you're using cationic lipids. Mammals don't have cationic lipids. We only have anionic lipids. So the cationic lipids, when they enter a lysosome, are essentially a proton sponge. The, the, the lysosome endosome naturally pumps hydrogen atoms into the uh, endosome to lower the pH. The cationic lipids and cationic material in the endosome binds the hydrogen ions and neutralizes their charge. The, the endosome continues to pump more hydrogen in. And when it does this, chloride follows and water follows to make up for the osmotic gradient. And that essentially leaves the endosome to burst or break open and release its contents. The second mechanism is called the flip-flop mechanism. And this is where now we're, we're delivering cationic material, lipids, polymers, et cetera. When they enter an endosome, the cationic lipids of the delivery system interact and bind to the anionic lipids on the inside of the endosome. They neutralize each other's charges and disrupt the membrane, which allows the nucleic acids to exit from the endosome. There are also fusion mechanisms, which is how viruses get into cells, but fusogenic peptides also have this property. And what a, fuse, a, a, a fusion molecule does is that it essentially inserts a lipid region into the opposing membrane and through a change in structure, merges the membranes, allowing the contents of the endosome or virus to escape into the cytoplasm. Here's a long list of proteins that are capable of doing this. You don't need to know that. Another interesting mechanism is that some uh, delivery methods and viruses encode a pore and the pore forms upon drop in pH, which essentially puts holes in the endosomal membrane and allows the nucleic acids to escape. So that, that's a, a, a sort of general background on how you, you need to develop a non-viral delivery system in order to deliver nucleic acids into a cell. I'm now going to talk about a bunch of therapeutic application systems. Um, I'm only going to concentrate on nucleoside-modified mRNA because that's what I work on and that's what I'm interested in. But similar things have been found with many other types of nucleic acids, including siRNAs, unmodified RNAs, and DNAs. So the, the earliest form of modified RNA therapy was for anemia. And we, we performed these studies around 10 years ago, I guess, uh, with the goal of using a modified RNA to deliver a therapeutic protein. In this case, it was erythropoietin. Uh, erythropoietin is a hormone that stimulates uh, bone marrow to produce red blood cells, and it's used for anemia. The early effects of EPO treatment are reticulocytes, which are nucleated red blood cells, 
And a later effect of EPO effect is a elevation in the hematocrit, the percent red blood cells in the serum. We delivered a nucleoside modified mRNA at increasingly low concentrations and found that as little as 10 nanograms of EPO pseudouridine mRNA induced a physiologic increase in reticulocytes. You can see that here. This is a, an EPO protein that's three times the physiologic dose. And you also see that it's a very nice dose response. A single injection of EPO mRNA significantly increases hematocrit in mice and weekly deliveries maintain that hematocrit at very high levels. Now, I, I, I wanna just tell you a funny story. Um, Katie Carrico and I worked on this study uh, a, a, a bunch of years ago. Katie's daughter is an Olympic uh, crew member. She was on the US Olympics eight uh, that won two gold medals in a row. After she won her first gold medal, Katie and I published this paper showing that we could surreptitiously increase people's hematocrit levels. And Katie's daughter became under increased security uh, trying to figure out if she used this method in order to win the gold medal. Uh, we, we had to apologize to her about that. The therapeutic monoclonal antibodies are probably the largest expanding field of pharmaceuticals at the present time. Monoclonal antibodies are used to treat autoimmune diseases, cancer, uh, osteoporosis, lipid metabolism, headaches, uh, and then their uses keep increasing. The problem with monoclonal antibodies are that you have to give very high doses uh, for prevention of HIV or influenza or other patho pathogenic diseases. You're often in the 10 to 20 mg per kg range. So that's grams of antibody per treatment. And monoclonal antibodies are very expensive to make. You have to make a cell that produces the antibody you have to put it in 50,000 liter drums. You have to purify the antibody away from all of the, uh, the cell culture media components. And every antibody is different. So you have to reinvent the wheel every time you do this. The thinking using a nucleic acid delivery system is that it's identical for every nucleic acid and it's much more efficient. So people have looked at viral and non-viral delivery of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. The first studies we did looked at VRC01, which is a broadly neutralizing HIV monoclonal antibody that neutralizes about 93% of HIVs worldwide. We encoded the heavy and light chains as mRNAs and put them into lipid nanoparticles and injected them into mice. Here's a comparison of VRC01 protein to nucleoside modified mRNA. This is the dose, this is 20 mg per kg for a mouse that you would give a human uh, in order to get protection. We found that we could give 1 40th that dose of mRNA and obtain similar levels. And most importantly, when we delivered this mRNA encoding VRC01, to humanize mice and challenge them with HIV, we found that as little as half a mg per kg could protect the mice from HIV infection. So studies are now uh, continuing on delivering monoclonal antibodies with mRNA as a, a, a very fast and inexpensive method for mass treatments. Uh, um, another group has used nucleoside modified mRNA encoding BNP2, bone morphogenic protein, as an mRNA. Now, the, the issue here is that BNP2 is an FDA approved protein used in promoting healing of difficult to heal bones. 
So orthopedic surgeons will sometimes use it for fractures that are resistant to healing. The problem and why they don't like to use it is that you have to use a very high dose of BNP protein that has a very short half-life. So what happens is that you put in a huge amount of BNP at the bone fracture, the BNP diffuses away from the fracture. So you end up calcifying all of the tissues around the bone uh, as well as the bone. So having calcif calcified muscle, calcified everything is not a good outcome. So people don't really like to use BMP2 protein because it doesn't work very well. So what, what the thinking of this group was is that mRNA releases protein over many days at a controllable rate. So when they treated bone with BMP2 encoding mRNA, what they found is that they could increase calcification. So if you look at the, here the bone shows up in black. And we can see that the mRNA encoded BMT has much more black. And below here, the, the calcification is stained as red. Um, you can see that the mRNA is superior at inducing calcification of bone. This is just a quantification that shows how much better it is at incorporating calcium. They then took a model system where they made a huge defect in the femur of rats and treated it either with nothing, with a, 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 a BMP DNA or a BMP2 mRNA. And what you can see is that in the presence of the mRNA, there's complete healing of the bone in very short amount of time. I believe this was about two weeks to get complete healing of this bone. Um, this again, just measures the, the volume of bone that's formed uh, and the density of the bone that's formed. And we can see that mRNA therapy gave very good bone healing with no uh, outside calcification of tissues. <coughs> so th this is being looked at as a way of promoting bone healing that has much more effectiveness than BMP protein. You can imagine that someday that an athlete breaks his arm in a, in a basketball game, um, goes in, gets BMP2 mRNA, and is back playing at full strength in two weeks. One of the, the biggest interests in uh, nucleic acid therapy is the delivery of gene editing systems using modified mRNA. The CAS system is a bacterial acquired immune response and bacteria use it to target foreign DNAs and it's a learned process. So what happens is that the first time a bacteria encounters a virus, a plasmid, any foreign DNA, the CAS system cuts it up into short stretches that are incorporated into regions. The next time the bacteria encounters that DNA, it picks up segments of that regions that then can specifically cut the plasmid or phage DNA, neutralizing the infection. It's been adapted to humans um, and it's been delivered with a bunch of different systems. So people have used a, a number of, of viral systems to deliver Cas9 protein. That's found to not be ideal. And the reason is, is that you're delivering a protein that can take short stretches of RNA and cut DNA. So having that protein resident in your cell for weeks or months leads to off-target cutting. Uh, and those, some of those off-target cuttings can lead to bad events such as carcinomas. mRNA has a very short time frame of protein production with very high levels of protein. So you get a short spike of protein production, which is more ideal for the delivery of a Cas9 protein. In this experiment, the, the researchers combined two methods 
they used mRNA to deliver the Cas9 protein and they delivered an AAV virus that encoded the guide RNAs that direct the Cas9 where to cut and the homologous recombination sequence that fixes the DNA at the site of the cut. The HR sequence has homology domains on either side of the site of the cut and then the corrected nucle uh, nucleotides in the center. So after the Cas9 cuts the DNA, the HR domain binds and directs a homology directed repair. They treated tyrosinemic mice with a, uh, a, an AAV with HR template that corrects the mutation and they could cure these mice of tyrosinemia as you can see on the, uh, the, the, the weight ratio curve. Um, None of the, all the control animals died re relatively quickly, but with repair using the mRNA AAV, the mice survived for long periods of time. The delivery of nucleic acids is a big problem. And that's because most delivery methods have a target organ that they deliver to. For lipid nanoparticles that are an FDA approved drug, it's mainly the liver. Um, so when you wanna now treat other tissues with a non-viral vector, you have to learn how to get that vector to target those other tissues. The easiest way is with the method of delivery. So if you inhale particles, they'll go to lung epithelial cells as the first site of contact. The researchers here took that into account and they treated a surfactant protein B deficient mouse. So this mouse is dependent on doxycycline to survive. When doxycycline is withdrawn, SPB is turned off and the mice uh, develop lung disease. They used a zinc finger and a homology, homology domain to deliver a CAG, which is a strong promoter into the middle of the SPB gene and got rid of the doxycycline dependence. When they did that, they, they completely preserved lung architecture. So this is normal lung with alveoli. This is treated with either an AAV donor of the zinc finger or an mRNA donor, all of these are the controls in the absence of, uh, of uh, insertion of the CAG, where you see destruction of lung architecture. So the mice treated with a, a simple inhalation of particles could cure their, their SPB disease uh, and uh, had 100% survival. mRNA has also been used to treat asthma, which is an interesting thought. And what the idea here was that there's a molecule known as FOXP3. It's a transcription factor that directs and drives T cells to form regulatory T cells. Regulatory T cells turn off immune responses by acting on antigen presenting cells and on uh, the, the effector cells themselves. So their idea was that if they delivered particles that contain a FOXP3 modified mRNA, it would target all cells in the lung, but it would turn the effector T cells into regulatory T cells. And those, those regulatory T cells would turn off the inflammation that leads to the lung disease. Here you can see that delivery of either, the, either an AAV FOXP3 or FOXP3 mRNA had large increases in the amount of FOXP3 mRNA and in the, the number of FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells in the lung. When they challenged mice with OVA, which uh, initiates lung inflammation, the treatment with FOXP3 either before or during or with AAV led to complete maintenance of lung structure and of airway epithelial structures. So they, they essentially cured the mice of a, a model of asthma using 
a modified mRNA delivered as a particle. The last thing I'll talk to you about is what we have a big interest in, which is mRNA LNP vaccines. So when you think about vaccines, there are many different types and there are many new ones that are being developed. And we're learning about that with this COVID epidemic because all of the new vaccines are suddenly having bright light sh shown on them. Prior to this episode, the main types of vaccines that were available were the first were the live viruses. These in general give excellent immune responses because they mimic the infection of, a, of the true pathogen with an attenuated virus. Um, they're difficult to make, they're expensive. Uh, the FDA doesn't like them. So people have also used killed viruses. Most influenza vaccines are killed viruses. They're again, expensive to make, uh, difficult to make. Um, the early polio vaccine had residual live polio virus in it. Uh, which led to quite a few problems. So uh, the, the, the goal of making easier, faster vaccines, such as nucleic acid vaccines, uh, is, is a, a major importance. Looking at this COVID epidemic, we saw that the biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies had vaccines ready within months after the COVID sequence was first published and into people that quickly, which is only allowed using a nucleic acid vaccine. So we developed nucleoside modified mRNA in LNPs as a vaccine. This, these are just other viral delivery systems in mice for an H1 virus. And with two immunizations, you get HAI titers, which are neutralization equivalent titers uh, averaging about a one to a hundred with two immunizations. With a single injection of MRI, mRNA, we had titers of one to 2,500. So 25 times higher with a single injection of mRNA LNPs. The titers were five times higher than acute infection of the animal with the virus. Going through this quickly, the reason why this vaccine works so well is that it specifically induces a type of CD4 helper known as T follicular helper cells. What a TFH does in its only job is to form germinal centers and drive B cell proliferation and affinity maturation in those germinal centers. So if you don't have TFH cells, you make a lousy antibody response. If you have a strong TFH response, you make very high affinity, uh, potent and durable antibody responses. With our vaccine, we measured about a tenfold increase in the number of TFH cells that were induced by the mRNA LNP vaccine which is the reason why the antibody titers are so high. We then looked in these animals at the different types of B cells using an antigen specific method. So what's done here is that an HA protein is tagged with a fluorescent molecule and the B cells are stained for subsets of B cells. This way you can measure the number or percent of antigen specific, of HA specific B cells in each population. We compared the mRNA vaccine to an inactivated virus, which is what us old folks get for our flu vaccines. And we saw that the mRNA induced a log and a half more germinal center memory and long lived plasma cells compared to the standard inactivated virus vaccine. The, the mRNA LNP vaccine platform is currently in two clinical trials, one by Moderna, one by Pfizer. Um, and so far the, the results have been very good. And we're hoping that these will be in people by the end of the year, beginning of next year. What was also interesting about the mRNA HA challenge is that 
usually when you immunize with an HA molecule, you get protection against the autologous virus and you rapidly lose protection as mutations appear in the HA head. That's why we have to remake the influenza vaccine every year. The mRNA vaccine specifically induces responses to subdominant epitopes. So those are epitopes that are not very immunogenic and don't usually appear with standard immunizations. In fact, we had so much non-stock uh, responses, uh, stock is a conserved region of HA, that we could challenge mice that were immunized with an H1 HA, with an H5 virus and have complete protection. So this is also being developed as a universal influenza vaccine. And I will stop there. Thank you very much, Drew. This was brilliant. And we have already three questions. Um, so let me start with the first. So it's from Arjun, he's from TGEM. And he asked, do cytosolic nuclear acid sensors play a role in affecting targeted delivery? Um, so we developed the nucleoside modified mRNA not to activate any RNA sensors. And that's what allows it to be used safely and to deliver very high levels of protein. So w w the, the RNA doesn't activate any of those sensors. We have a, a big program using targeted delivery. We can currently target bone marrow stem cells, T cells, uh, liver, brain, lung, uh, and we're developing more. But those are usually based on cell surface receptor recognition by the targeting particles. Thanks. Um, Mark has a question saying, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on advantages and disadvantages of lipid nanoparticles compared to polyplexes like PI for in vivo delivery. Yeah, so th that's really an empirical field. The, the lipid nanoparticles are part of an FDA approved drug. So th they're approved, they've been shown to be safe at much higher doses uh, than are commonly used for nucleic acids. Um, they are very specific in their delivery to liver and dendritic cells. Uh, so the, I, I think whenever somebody wants liver delivery uh, or dendritic cell delivery, they go to LNPs. We've been able to target the LNPs to many other structures. The problem is that many other delivery systems have much higher levels of toxicity, which makes them difficult to work with in vivo. Um, we're always looking for new systems of delivery. So we, we look at everyone that's ever, that, that comes out. Uh, so far, LNPs are the best. Thanks. And uh, George is asking about mRNA of BMP2 administration to the damaged femur. How is the application? And a second question, and how to avoid the calcification in other non-specified areas? So what they did is they actually, that they put the mRNA into a, a, a semi-solid support structure and they use that structure to fill in the gap in the bone. The idea being is that the osteoblast would migrate into that structure, encounter the BMP2 and be stimulated to produce bone. Um, and, and it worked very well as you saw from the pictures. There isn't extraneous BMP production because the mRNA stays in the support unlike the protein that diffuses away from bone, that the mRNA stays in the support. So you only get bone formation where that structure is placed on the bone. Okay, thanks. Um, while we are waiting uh, for other questions, maybe one from my side, so similar to the one of Mark, if you, um, look at lipid nanoparticles and compare them to, to viral vectors. I know viral vectors is also a broad area. 
But I mean, there are some advantages and disadvantages if you look into these quite different strategies of delivery. Could you maybe summarize those which are the, the most prominent from your point of view? So th to me, the biggest difference is that using lipid nanoparticles and really any uh, synthetic delivery system, the, the, the escape of the nucleic acid from the endosome is inefficient. For LNPs, it's calculated that about 2% of the mRNA in the endosome makes it to the cytoplasm. So it's a very inefficient process. Unlike viruses that are closer to 50 to 100% depending on the virus. So LNPs are inefficient at releasing their nucleic acid. Usually cells aren't infected with a thousand particles uh, and you can deliver a thousand LNPs to a cell. So that, that partially makes up for this inefficiency. But to me, the, the greatest advance in, in non-viral delivery would be to figure out how to more efficiently get nucleic acid into the cytoplasm or nucleus. Okay, thank you. So with this, I would like to close uh, this uh, e-school and thank you again, Drew, for this beautiful talk. I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience also, also seen from the questions. And I also would like to invite our audience to stay for the next talk, which is um, spotlight on sars coronavirus entry which is just following and please also join us next week when urs greber is speaking about learn from viruses to improve viral and non-viral vectors so thanks again drew and you all for listening bye bye thank you